another hour or so. What we will do, and I talked to uh, Senator Reed, and he and I are both going to waive our opening statements. Uh, we're going to try to, and I think we'll also waive your statements, your opening statements also, get right into questions. We'll stay, we'll be pretty strict on our five-minute questions, and I think we can get around to everyone if we do it that way. So that's, that's what the plan is. Two minutes ahead. Oh, I know. We're, we're, we're starting early. That's right. That's good. Yeah, the meeting will come to order. I've already kind of explained the situation we have. You and I are both going to uh, um, waive our opening statements as are our witnesses, and uh, then we get right into questions. I think we'll be fine with the votes coming up that way. So uh, that being the case, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and just uh, start with questions. And I, I've got, I only have one that I really wanted to get to. And I talked to both of you guys uh, on, on other occasions about this, but uh, what we ran up against, and this was kind of a surprise to a lot of us, the NNSA's primary job is to build the, the nuclear warheads to meet the requirements of the Department of Defense. And earlier this year, when we heard that the NNSA budget had been cut. We called the DOD and asked them what they thought, and to my surprise, but I got a hold of them, they said they didn't know because they don't get it until after, uh, after uh, such time as, as the, as actually, the, I think the energy gets it first. And so they didn't have it. And that's something that I was, I'm not sure how it happened. Then I went back and, uh, and I've, I've talked to you folks about, what are you really able to do if you don't hear about what the budget is before it's it's a, the already signed off or in the process of being concluded? And that is something that we have a concern about. Then it reminded me, back when I was first elected, and that was when David Boren had this job, and he called me, I remember this, this was way back in 1994. He called me up and he said, well, you know, I've, I've, there's something I've been trying to get done for a long time and I've failed. Maybe you can do it. And it was correcting this very problem that we're pointing out right now. So we may be addressing this. Uh, so the question I would ask you is, do you agree this thing ought to be changed? You've got to be in on this thing to know. You, know, you remember what we did earlier this year. We had to go in and talk to the president because they had dropped the, the budget down uh, about uh, about 8%. Uh, on NNSA, and, uh, and nobody was aware of it except the Department of Energy. So we went and talked to the president and had a meeting, and we brought it back up to just under the, the 20 figure. So that's what happened there. Do, you, do you, uh, the two of you agree that this is something that needs to be corrected after all these years? Senator, uh, one, I, I applaud yours and the committee's leadership in, uh, in addressing the necessary resources for the nuclear weapons complex. Uh, that, along with nuclear command and control and recapitalization of the triad systems, are essential uh, for maintaining strategic deterrence, which is foundational to everything else we do inside the Defense Department. Uh, Chairman, you are well aware uh, of the responsibility of the Nuclear Weapons Council to certify in an NSA's budget, and I have a role in providing a recommendation to the Nuclear Weapons Council to that end. Okay. Uh, if there are uh, weaknesses, and, and you uh, described one, in terms of our ability in a timely manner to do that, uh, that is something that uh, I will take up with the Secretary to address how we might be able to do that better. Well, why don't we do this uh, for the record? We'll just uh, start this, uh, this discussion going and not try to do it uh, under the timelines we're dealing with today. So I'll go ahead and um, had one other area to bring up. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Last summer, the, miss, uh, the Missile Defense Agency canceled the program to modernize the ground-based interceptors that were uh, up in Alaska, and um, due to technical failures, the next generation interceptor then we find will not likely be fielded until 2030. And I think that'd be a good thing for you to answer on the record as to what about that gap? Can we handle that gap? Because everyone up here is going to be interested in that. Okay, uh, Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Richard, uh, I'm terribly concerned that there's been no significant effort to extend the New START agreement with uh, Russia. Uh, and do you believe that New START treaty gives you critical value in planning strategic deterrence based upon on-site inspections and declarations? And if it is not extended, you will be at a disadvantage? Senator, uh, as you know, uh, New START Treaty has been valuable to this nation and to my command. The Russians are largely compliant with it. Uh, it does have the benefit of not only limiting the total number of uh, strategic weapons to both nations benefit, and it has the transparency and confidence building measures that you just described, all of which has been good for deterrence. However, it does not address a very large class of uh, weapons that the Russians have a significant advantage in. It doesn't constrain novel systems and it is a bilateral treaty. Ultimately, a decision to extend a treaty is a political decision. Uh, I do provide best military advice down the lines of what I just offered uh, to my department to contribute to that. But I, I, if we do not do this, we will lose a great deal uh, in terms of deterrence, in terms of uh, just, as I mentioned previously, uh, signaling for the first time in 40 plus years there is no arms control regime in the world and that could lead to proliferation not just uh, uh, eroded uh, relationships between Russia and the United States and thank you General I, Admiral I just want to in the context of moving quickly General Shaughnessy one of the issues that came up in our discussions and also in your testimony is the threat of cruise missiles to the United States and we we're configured pretty well since the 1950s for ballistic missiles, uh, but cruise missiles and other hypersonic weapon systems are, are more challenging. Uh, give us an idea of what you think you need to be effective to deal with this cruise missile threat. Uh, thank you, Senator, for highlighting that important threat that we have facing us today as a nation and something that we really have to invest in in order to maintain our competitive advantage and our ability to defend this great nation over time. Uh, specifically, I think as we look at the the way we've been approaching the threats, we've been looking at them from the ballistic missile standpoint and then uh, cruise missiles, uh, kind of UASs, and I think we have to look at this more holistically. And really, we need domain awareness over our entire territory and the approaches to it. Uh, and then if we're able to have that domain awareness with sensors from the undersea all the way up through space, mm -hmm. we can then take that to be able to defend ourselves against all the threats, to include the cruise missile threat that you mentioned. Some of the things that we are doing right now to get after that, as an example of this year's budget, uh, we're increasing our domain awareness capability with sensors within the national capital region, for example, with our wide area surveillance program. We have money this year for over-the-horizon radars that will not only be helpful uh, for um, cruise missile threats, but also hypersonic threats. Uh, and we also have uh, funding in place for some additional radars to give us the ability to truly see and understand the domain uh, on the approaches to us. But this is just a start. Senator, what I would say is we have to invest into the future and understanding what is happening in and around our territory and really understanding uh, our ability to have defeat mechanisms that can defeat these proliferated threats such as the cruise missiles. Thank you very much. I yield back uh, all my time. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Richard, your opening statement refers to an increase in both Russian and Chinese yeah, nuclear does. forces. On page four, it states that China is likely to double the size of their yeah. stockpile by the end yeah. of this decade. Yeah. And on page five, it states that Russia's sure. overall nuclear stockpile yeah. is, quote, likely to grow significantly yeah. over the next dec decade, end quote. Does our current program of record for modernization expand our nuclear forces? Uh, Senator, it does not. Uh, we do not seek parity, uh, and it's not only in the statement in terms of what they are going to do. We could also back up and look at what Russia in particular has been doing over the last 15 years to expand and modernize her arsenal, all while we just extended life-extended systems that we already have. 
So the recapitalization that we're asking for is one for one. We don't seek more. Uh, we don't seek a greater number. We simply seek a sufficient number in, uh, of capabilities to enable us to achieve national objectives. I've been struck by the reception that this budget has gotten. Earlier this week, a New York Times column summed up the budget's investment in nuclear modernization by saying, quote, the president's spending proposal requests money for a new arms race with Russia and with China and restores nuclear weapons as central to military policy, end quote. The truth is actually the opposite of that. There's no policy change, as you stated, that relates to nuclear weapons in this budget, and it is Russia and China that are expanding their arsenals Why we are not. Is that correct? Senator, to, to, uh, I must confess the whole concept that we're starting an arms race baffles me uh, in terms of no nation has done more than the United States to reduce the reliance on nuclear weapons. No nation has divested more nuclear weapons than the United States has. We have waited 15 years in some cases to the absolute limits of what our systems will go before we simply sought to replace like for like inside our triad. So I don't understand where the concept of an arms race comes in, and you're absolutely correct, ma'am. Thank you. On page 12 of your prepared remarks, you state, quote, our nuclear deterrent underwrites every U.S. military operation around the world and is the foundation and backstop of our national defense. I cannot overemphasize the need to modernize our nuclear forces and recapitalize the supporting infrastructure to ensure we can maintain this deterrent in the future. I am concerned that the oft-repeated message of the need to modernize and recapitalize has lost its impact, and that collectively we have underestimated the risks associated with such a complex and time-constrained <laughs> modernization and recapitalization effort. Even seemingly small issues can have a disproportionate impact on the force. We cannot afford more delays and uncertainty in delivering capabilities and must maintain a focus on revitalizing our nuclear forces and the associated infrastructure, end quote. I really appreciate your candor on this. As you know, we continue to hear calls to slow down, to cut funding, and to reexamine issues that have already been studied numerous times. And I appreciate your clear, clear description of the urgency that we have. Do you have anything you would like to add to that? No, ma'am, um, other than- I took the words right out of your mouth. Y yes, ma'am. Uh, we chose those very carefully to uh, accurately describe the situation this nation faces, right? These, uh, uh, these capabilities are foundational to our survival as a nation. Uh, it is a great credit that we've been able to take the it's a once every other generation responsibility to recapitalize the strategic deterrent. Uh, we had wise leaders back in the 80s who saw the need for this, uh, leadership and resources, and we have benefited with no nuclear use for um, up to 42 years in some cases with particular weapon systems, no great power war, and uh, the return on investment that we achieved, the, the submarine is a great example, designed for 30 years, we thought that's what we were going to get. In fact, you wind up getting 42. What a credit to the people that designed it, built it, operated it, that we were able to take it out as far as we can. But in the submarine's case, we're literally reaching physics and engineering limits such that you cannot extend it. Uh, you can only take a piece of high-strength steel pressurize it at great depths, then take that pressure back off before you just don't want to get in the tube anymore. And so that's the limits that we have reached, and it is uh, our turn to provide that leadership for the next 40 or 50 years to give them the benefits that we've already received. Thank you, and thank you, General O'Shaughnessy, for your um, meeting with me yesterday. I would, I would commend to my colleagues that uh, they also contact you to have a classified briefing on uh, what we need to do with our cruise missiles. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Fisher. Since the quorum is now present, I ask the committee to consider two civilian nominations and a list of 871 pending military nominations. All the nominations have been before the committee the required length of time. First, I ask the committee to consider a nomination of James McPherson to be Under Secretary of the Army and Charles Williams to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy for in, uh, Energy, Installation, and Environment. Uh, is there a motion to favorably report these two civilian nominations out? Uh, uh, 
Uh, second. second. Anyone, any opposition uh, that does pass? I thought we had the other one on here for the for the 871. Sir? We yeah. should have the other one here, shouldn't we? Is that for the military members? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. And finally, I ask the committee to consider a list of 871 pending military nominations. Is there a motion to favorably uh, report these 871? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, it, it carries. Now, for those who may have come in a little bit late, we are waiving opening statements. We're going to get right to the, um, uh, to the questions, and we're going to adhere to the five-minute rule. Thank you very much. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here and for your service. Um, I want to follow up on Senator Reed's question about the New START Treaty because, as he pointed out, um, we are less than a year from its expiration. We could extend it for five years without uh, going through a whole Senate confirmation process. Um, and it seems to me, while I recognize the concern that you expressed, Admiral Richard, that I have heard from other sources about the fact that it doesn't encompass a number of other weapons. Um, the fact is we could extend it and work on those other weapons at the same time without losing the important information that we are currently getting from New START. So I wonder if you could describe how STRATCOM uses information from New START, such as through inspections and data exchanges, as you look at your day-to-day -day planning. Uh, Senator, so uh, the, that insight, right, gives us a much better idea of what the threat level is from the, that particular class of uh, uh, weapon systems are, which enables us to do a, a very uh, calculated and thorough job of determining exactly how we deter the use of that. Uh, all very valuable uh, and uh, helpful, right? So I would desire to keep those attributes, but I'm also required to do the same thing on the parts that aren't included in the treaty. Yeah. So better for me if we could go down a path to address all of that. Sure. But if, but if we do not extend New START and it expires next February, you lose that information. That is, is that correct? correct? Um, I think this is probably for General O'Shaughnessy. Last August, 33 airmen from New Hampshire's Air National Guard spent several weeks on a remote Alaskan island near the Bering Sea. I'm sorry, Senator Sullivan isn't here, because they were part of a rotating group of airmen and guardsmen who were helping to build a new home for a group of indigenous people who have been displaced due to rising sea levels. Can you talk about what you see from climate change and what um, what we're tr doing to try and um, shore up our infrastructure and to be prepared for the challenges we're going to face as climate change increases and creates more of these kinds of situations? Senator, what I would uh, talk to is the importance of the Arctic and specifically in this case Alaska. Uh, not only, uh, as you mentioned, with increased activity and the things that we were seeing and some problems with erosion uh, that are very real. Uh, and they're real for both the military aspects as well as, of course, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the indigenous population. One of the things that we try to do is we, we partner, as you mentioned, uh, with uh, organizations that are tied to the indigenous people. For example, Julie Kika and AFN has been a, a great partner because I think we have common challenges of which we might have common solutions. And so whether it's we went to Barrow, for example, and saw some of the erosion um, that is caused as the ice has, has melted and, the, and now the waves are, are hitting the shore. That affects us and some of our radar installations just as much as it affects the, the local village. And so we're trying to partner with the local communities to tru truly understand uh, what is happening and the impacts. Uh, but we also see it because simultaneously this is a critical part, part for us for the defense of our homeland. If you look at it as an avenue of approach, and we see the Arctic as an avenue of approach to our homeland that we need to be able to defend and we need to be able to operate out of. And therefore, you need infrastructure. You need the ability to actually uh, bring your force in and sustain a force. You need to be able to communicate. Uh, you need to actually understand what's happening in that domain and have the domain awareness. And so these are very similar. We find multiple opportunities in some of the forums that we've led um, with our uh, partners in both industry, uh, local populations, local communities, all the way down to the villages, that we find uh, these common um, approaches that we, can, we might be able to solve. We're working, for example, in communications that might help us with the proliferation of WIO, 
uh, that would bring communication not only to us as a military, but even to the remotest villages. So as you're, you're looking at preparing budgets for future years, how are you factoring in the cost of those infrastructure needs that we have as we're seeing the impacts of climate change? All right, so what we're doing is we're trying to look at the infrastructure that we need, the infrastructure that we need to be able to defend our nation. And this is actually not just with the U.S. We're working in partnership with Canada, uh, especially with my NORAD hat on. We're very interested in, in the similar issues that we see from the Canadian front of having an infrastructure in place throughout the Arctic that will give us the ability to defend our nation. Uh, and in doing so, we have to have the sustainability of that in infrastructure going into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Um, and Admiral Richard, I'll, I'll start with you. And as we continue the discussion about modernization, uh, as has been discussed, the ground-based strategic deterrent will replace the Minuteman III as the sole intercontinental ballistic missile uh, starting about mid-20s. And Congress has appropriated the funds to do that for this fiscal year. Um, but while the GBSD will enter service this de decade, the Air Force will continue to sustain the Minuteman III into the 2030s. Um, this is an old program from the 1970s, and I think some of the silos date back to maybe even the 1960s. And I'm, I am concerned about uh, failure to modernize uh, with our nuclear deterrent. And I think that in the long run, this will be a lot more costly and uh, makes it a risky gamble with our, our national survival. So just if you can, um, how are we balancing the maintenance issues that, that will occur as we continue to um, hold on to the Minuteman Three, and talk a little bit about that. And are you confident then that as we move into the new system that uh, the timeline is suitable as a deterrent? Senator, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, it is yet another example of why we have no margin left, right, in terms of the need to recapitalize. But in terms of sustainment of Minuteman Three, I, um, I, I'm not sure that it is often recognized the extraordinary, extraordinary levels the Air Force went to to be able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Unlike a submarine, which is designed to have depot level maintenance in it, the Minuteman Three was not. It was designed to serve for a certain period of time and get replaced. And the Air Force went in after the fact and figured out how to take that and get a depot maintenance um, capability retrofitted into the weapon system that will then enable it to go till the crossover point. I think it's a great credit to the Air Force they were able to accomplish that. And that's what gives me confidence, provided no further delay in GBSD, that um, this will work. Well, God bless the Air Force, you know, their extraordinary effort. Um, and it just uh, points to the fact, though, that con as Congress, we need to be aware of these issues and make sure that we, we stay on top of it. Um, and General O'Shaughnessy, uh, thank you for, for being here. I'm going to redirect and talk about something that hasn't been brought up yet. Um, at the Southcom posture hearing, uh, I asked Admiral Fowler about challenges with uh, COCOM and interagency coordination to stop the flow of drugs and human trafficking uh, over our southern border and entering into the United States. And, you know, it's surprising, but my home state of Iowa really sees one of the highest rates of human trafficking. And I know that there are many colleagues here that have those same concerns and same issues in their home states. And we have also felt uh, the the pain and the pressure of illicit drugs that enter into uh, the stream in our states. And so um, what I'd like to hear from you is uh, thoughts on how that interagency and uh, coordination is going, the collaboration that you might have with Southcom, and what are the efforts that we see to uh, push back on some of the, the flows of drugs and human trafficking? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for highlighting that. One of the things that we do find is a, a very strong collaboration amongst the interagency. I think it starts with the interdiction committee and, 
and that is, is led, of course, by the drug czar and, and Admiral Schultz as the, mm -hmm. the co-chairs. But it brings the entire uh, interagency together with respect to the counter-narcotics, counter-drug, and the, 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 the uh, transnational organized crime and the aspects of that. And it's a great form of which we all get together. Admiral Fowler's there as well as mm -hmm. myself uh, to, really, to, to really bring the team together, if you will. Uh, in addition, as you mentioned, Southcom and Northcom have a great relationship. In fact, uh, Admiral Fowler is actually my cousin, mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out. And so, so there's a great relationship. Okay, good. Uh, there. Um, <laughs> Sounds and, a lot like Iowa. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we see that we clearly have to work together as, as we do this. And so we actually went down together uh, to Mexico mm -hmm. City to meet with the, the, the Mexican leadership. Uh, and especially looking at Sedena and Samar and the great work that they are doing to yeah. help with the, both the migration flow and the car not, car narcotics problem. And then we went right from there to Guatemala. Uh, and we were able to uh, work with the local Guatemalan officials and really see how do we stem this flow and how do we get to the roots to be able to stem that flow. And so I think it's those kind of relationships and that working together that's important, but it's also important what we're doing on our actual border. And so as you, as you know, we, we are very uh, active with respect to some of the work that we're doing to provide assistance. We're not the lead federal agency, but we provide great assistance because we see this as a national crisis. 68, 69,000 right. Americans uh, killed last year. That is something that we have to be part of the solution, and, and we are. Uh, we flew over 5,000 hours in support of that last year, uh, over 2,000 uh, man days of, of, of uh, intelligence analysis. This is one of the things I think we bring as the military, yep. that we can bring that expertise and bring that right to our interagency partners. Uh, and so we'll, we continue to, to find those areas where we can bring that, that rig value uh, to the interagency process. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here, and thank you for your service. Admiral, thanks particularly for your enormous contribution to our submarine force. Uh, I assume you continue to share the Navy's strategy and support it to achieve 66 submarines by 2048. Senator, I do. I'm uh, somewhat disquieted, even dismayed, by the apparent change of pace and construction reflected in this budget, dropping one of the submarines that was planned for this year at the uh, electric boat shipyard. Do you share that concern that we may be falling off the necessary pace? Senator, one, I am pleased that uh, Navy is maintaining the highest priority on the Columbia-class submarine, which directly supports my mission set. And beyond that, I think that is just indicative of uh, the difficult budget choices that Navy and the whole Department of Defense are having to make. But those budget choices reflect priorities, and this, the Virginia class, and I agree with you completely about the Columbia class, and there's a lot of progress in the budget in that regard, but the Virginia class uh, is essential to our undersea superiority, is it not? Senator, the Virginia-class submarine is the finest submarine in the world. And we want to continue to build more of them. Uh, absolutely, sir. In that, in that regard, uh, I want to ask about uh, hypersonic missiles, uh, which in your testimony you say, quote, ensure our deterrence and conventional power remains strong in the future. Are you satisfied with the investment that we're making in hypersonic missiles, given the Russians and the Chinese investing so heavily in them? And that can be a question for both of you. Well, Senator, what I will start with, because there's two ways to answer, there's two aspects to your question. One is offensive use of hypersonics by us, and plus there is a defensive piece. And uh, I remind everybody, the, the Russians have publicly reported that they have hypersonics on, on alert now. Um, and so this is a very real thing. My command has had a long-standing requirement for conventional prompt strike that hypersonic technologies uh, would be an ideal way to go accomplish that, and I think that enables me to better deter threats to this nation. And so, uh, also, I have responsibility for global strike already uh, inside the uh, Department of Defense, and I think we would be an ideal command because we have concepts, command and control, uh, ready to go to use that to best advantage. Are you? Are you satisfied, though, that we're investing sufficiently in all of the aspects of hypersonics, both offensive yeah, and Senator, I am. I was actually very pleased in the priority. Uh, it's in, uh, in line with the national defense strategy in terms of the priority that this budget submission puts in that and a couple of other technical areas. 
Are you concerned about a developing potential arms race in hypersonics? Um, Senator, no. Again, uh, it is, do you have sufficient capability technologies to meet our national objectives? Uh, and I think we're on pace to do that. And Senator, I, I would highlight on, on the defensive side, one of the key aspects, I think, is the space sensing layer and the importance that we invest in that and continue to invest, which we are, and this budget includes that, but we need to, to continue to invest in that space sensing layer because as we go from a a ballistic missile to a hypersonic glide vehicle, for instance, it really changes the problem of maintaining custody of that weapon system throughout its entire flight, and the best way to get at that is a space sensing layer. So I strongly endorse continued investment in that for a defensive. And it's not just, it's also about awareness, because unlike a ballistic missile where you know where it's going, the hypersonic glide vehicle, you don't necessarily know because it has the energy and the ability to maneuver. And so we have to be able to keep track of that. And so I can give the warning to Admiral Richard uh, so he knows where that is going from the, from the NORTHCOM and NORAD perspective. Well, I agree with you that it introduces a potential game-changing technology and new challenges in terms of both defense and deterrence and offense. And I'd like to ask for more information, perhaps in a classified setting, if we can arrange a briefing. I'm also going to submit for the record, because we're adhering strictly to time limits, questions on uh, the uh, threats posed by cyber. I understand there was a recent uh, cybersecurity conference that involved uh, National Guard, uh, which I'd like to learn more about, and also uh, troops at the border. So I'll be submitting questions for the record on those two topics. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Admiral Richard, I want to return to the budget for the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, the President's budget has it at just under $20 billion. Are you confident uh, that that is a sufficient number to proceed with nuclear modernization? Senator Cotton, the short answer is yes. There's not a lot of excess margin in that number, but it is sufficient. And I'll also offer that I have a very close relationship with NNSA. I just spoke to Ms. Gordon Haggerty actually yesterday in a continuing series, and I point to that as an example of us uh, making sure that she has the right resources. And that if you take the warhead modernization program on the one hand, and you take the triad modernization, the delivery systems on the other hand, that is also a number that's satisfactory to keep those two things integrated over the next several years? Senator, yes, again with no extra margin, uh, and I would throw in uh, uh, nuclear command and control as the third piece of that that is also needs to be synchronized. I, I would as well, given the fact that we have woefully, woefully undercapitalized our nuclear command and control and infrastructure over the last many decades. Um, but one thing I hear you say, not much excess margin to the extent that Congress doesn't meet that budget number. Um, of just under $20 billion, would we be introducing more risk into those programs for every dollar that we go below it? Senator, yes. And in fact, we are close enough in to this recapitalization that uh, we can also give you a number where you start to see points of no return, right? And they are not that far off. They're in the uh, early 30s that if we don't recapitalize now, we simply lose the fundamental infrastructure and capacity that if we cross over, you can't recover for like a decade, no matter how much money you put at it. Uh, those, are, those points are starting to come into view. Okay. General O'Shaughnessy, I want to talk about the Wuhan coronavirus. And it is the Wuhan coronavirus, not some politically correct name that a bunch of politically correct bureaucrats at the World Health Organization have come up with to give you a sense of their misplaced priorities. You were recently directed uh, in your role as commander of the Northern Command uh, to begin prudent planning for a potential pandemic. I think it's very prudent to begin prudent planning. So could you talk us through uh, what the role for Northern Command would be in such a situation and the extent to which you've already begun planning or even exercises for that scenario? Uh, yes, sir. So, Senator, what, what we're doing first in the, in the immediate um, uh, actions we've taken has been in support of the Health and hu Human Services with respect to housing some uh, Americans coming home. Uh, and, I, and I think we've, uh, right now, we have over 600 still uh, in our facilities uh, in support of uh, 
uh, both the State Department bringing their, their folks home as well as HHS. Uh, that has been going extremely well, and we appreciate the close co coordination through the interagency to make that happen. It also is tied to 11 airports, of which we have facilities that are on standby in, coordin with both, in coordination with both Department of Homeland Security uh, as well as uh, HHS and CDC, as you would imagine. Uh, and those ongoing uh, collaboration continues to make sure that we are part of the support structure that we would have here within the United States to be able to respond to this virus. Now, to your point about the global aspects of this and our role with NORTHCOM, uh, we are, as you would expect, doing the appropriate prudent military planning to ensure that we are able to respond. Uh, it, the types of things that we're doing is, for example, we're running a VTC every single day uh, to make sure, and that includes representatives from all around the globe, all the geographic combatant commands that are in there to make sure that we see what is happening within their regions, and then we are centrally uh, managing that uh, from our, our headquarters in NORTHCOM. Uh, we, are, we have plans in place, uh, as you would imagine, uh, that look for what, are the, what is the scope that this could go to potentially uh, and making sure that we're not caught by surprise. And so uh, both our role that we're doing in the day-to-day -day, uh, is very much informative to the role that we're doing for the planning and making sure that we are prepared for what the worst case scenario that might happen and make sure we're doing that globally, not just here in the United States. Thank you, General. Um, I, I think we're still at only 14 cases in the United States that have been confirmed by public health authorities. Um, That's correct, sir. Let's hope that remains the case. Um, I think we're in a much better position than we were a few weeks ago when we had 20,000 people landing in the United States from mainland China every single day. So I commend the President and the administration for the travel ban put in place. But there are still around a million and a half in Americans who traveled from mainland China, or a million and a half persons who traveled from mainland China starting in mid-November until the travel ban went into place. So we have even a fraction of what China reported just overnight of 14,000 cases, which I should add were not newly discovered cases or the result of new scientific breakthroughs, but a political decision to finally start getting a little bit closer to the truth. Then obviously it's gonna put a lot of uh, emphasis and stress on the mission and the planning that you and your people have been doing. So thank you for that. Uh, Admiral Richard, uh, congratulations on your assumption of command, and I'd be remiss if I didn't invite you back to Sandia and Los Alamos. I know you've been there before. Um, but during your confirmation hearing, uh, you agreed that restoring plutonium pit production at Los Alamos is the military's top priority. However, in your answer, you also stated that there are issues. And now that you've had a little time to work with NNSA and get up to speed on that, I'd like to ask you to articulate what the specific issues and impediments are that you see in meeting the, the current goals. Well, Senator, when I talked about the weapons complex infrastructure, the plutonium pit would be the first thing that I would call attention to in terms of uh, our nation's ability to generate that number of pits. That is essential simply for the sustainment programs, right, that we, we desire to go do. And the, the concern actually, again, was funding, right? Step one is to provide adequate resources, um, and I'm, I'm very confident, particularly in the near term at Los Alamos, right, that with adequate funding, uh, we can deliver the 30 pits per year by 2026. And I continue to work with uh, NNSA and Ms. Gordon Haggerty to make sure the longer term plan is also, uh, I have equal confidence in that. One of my concerns with regard to that is if, if we're gonna do pit production at two locations, and the intellectual capital is currently um, pretty much all at Los Alamos, not losing, not poaching that capital to a second facility before we actually get job number one done. Uh, what Do you share those concerns? Well, Senator, I, not only do I share them, um, but it is uh, in the uh, uh, weapons complex and other areas writ large, is it, uh, do we have enough talent uh, to be able to accomplish what we have to go do? So I work with Ms. Gordon Haggerty closely on uh, her stack of responsibilities with regards to that, as well as we do a number of things at U.S. Strategic Command to bring talent into the strategic deterrence area writ large. I can give you a longer answer if you uh, for a question for the record, but for example, we have an academic alliance with over 70 colleges and universities where we're trying to encourage uh, people to uh, come in and uh, develop uh, expertise in national security, strategic deterrence, and the weapons complex benefits from that. As you've uh, articulated, we're, um, we're pushing up against very thin margins on all three parts of the triad. What are the consequences for your command if any one of those legs experiences a significant delay? And how would you, if, if, 
that were to occur, how would you rebalance? Senator, when I thank you for that question, uh, and, and I, I think we all well know the commanders of Strategic Command have been repeatedly asked that question over time, and part of how we got to the point that we're at was by doing operational mitigations to make up for uh, lack of earlier decisions to recapitalize. We are very close to turning that rheostat about as far as it's going to go. So the last remaining things that I have, and you can refer to them as a head, sometimes that is more thought of for the weapons complex, but the triad itself was built with an overlapping interlocking set of attributes that are very complementary, and each leg makes up for the weaknesses in the other leg. I would get to the point where I'd have to start basically, that's called interleg hedging. I'd have to start taking the attributes of the triad apart, uh, and I'll lose um, uh, attributes along the way. So I can cross cover with one piece of the triad on another, but I may lose the survivability of the ballistic missile submarines. I may lose the flexibility and signaling for the bombers. That's about what's left for us to do. Um. Moving on real quick, I don't have a lot of time left, but you're familiar with my interest in, in hypersonics and in per, more broadly in just maintaining the R&D focus to have a third offset, um, whether that's through the lens of hypersonics or directed energy or, for that matter, artificial intelligence. Um, we're seeing a big bump in this, in this budget in the area of hypersonics. It's a 3.2 billion overall number. It's a 23 percent increase. How's that money going to be spent so that um, you know when you're scaling that you're still efficient and spending it wisely? Senator, that uh, question would be best answered by the services that are responsible. All of them are working on it. I am pleased with the progress, and I am uh, working to make sure that when that capability is delivered, I'm ready to receive it with concepts of operation and command and control, uh, being able to immediately put it to use defending the nation. Thank you, Chairman. Sure. First, thank you both for your service. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, I'm um, I've, I think we've all been following what Communist China has been doing around the world. Um, I'm from Florida, and so everybody in Florida is clearly uh, watching what's happening in, in Latin America, and uh, especially Communist China's involvement in Venezuela, but even in other countries with their investments. How how does and you know what they're trying to do is build relationships and make people dependent on them. How does Communist China's involvement in Latin America impact our national security? Well, I think uh, you bring up a good point because sometimes it's easy to forget about our own neighborhood uh, as we look at this global uh, competition that we're in with China. Uh, Admiral Fowler has done a really good job, I think, of highlighting that and, and the consequences thereof and the focus that we need to have, not only within the Department of Defense, but as a nation uh, to that. Of course, we also see it, for example, in the Bahamas, which is even closer to home, uh, where we see China's uh, trying to get an influence with uh, one of our closest neighbors and, and great partners. Um, and so I think we have to be cognizant of it. We have to think about it uh, from the aspect of what are the implications uh, to us from a national security standpoint, and then what are the implications to us just as a nation uh, as we see uh, this global competition playing out in our own hemisphere uh, close to home. Sure. Um, Thank you. Admiral Richard, uh, what, do you think we have enough, um, whether it's R Communist China or Russia, uh, Russia in Latin America, do you think we have the right amount of assets there and the right amount of focus there, or do, or do we need to put more focus based on what they're doing uh, to try to have an impact close, close to our borders? Senator, one, I, I applaud the chairman of the Joint Chiefs focus um, um, broadly on global integration. And when you take a global view of uh, the competitions that we have, it drives visibility into those areas. So I think the department is moving in the right direction to look at the totality of what we need to be concerned about and not just focus on one geographic region. So um, Canada's about to make a decision on 5G on uh, Huawei. Um, and the, it's my understanding that the military uh, establishment in Canada has said that uh, Trudeau administration should not go forward with doing any business with Huawei with regard to their 5G. How will that impact our, uh, our relationship with Canada if they do? Uh, Senator, what I would say is clearly we see the, the security implications of 5G, not only with uh, Canada, but with our allies and partners and even here at home. Uh, clearly we see this as a national security implications at large. Uh, and making sure that we, with all our allies and partners, that they uh, all go into any negotiations and ultimately procurement of infrastructure with clear eyes to truly understand what are the risks 
uh, and then what can we do to mitigate uh, those risks. Uh, and so I think as we do continue to work uh, with Canada as a close ally and a partner, uh, that just like we've done with other allies and partners, we need to make sure that we're sharing all of the intel that we have, which we are, uh, and making sure that we provide them all the things that they need to make the proper decision and an informed decision uh, to fully understand the risks that they take and the ultimately the implications that, to your point, that we might have here at home with what we can share with them, how we would share with them, uh, and what the implications would be. I think as we look at Canada with the NORAD aspect of that, that becomes even closer to home because of our binational relationship we have with them and making sure that we uh, understand uh, the rippling effects uh, of potential security um, uh, concerns uh, relative to Huawei, 5G, and, and we see as very real concerns. So, what, so knowing, the, knowing the risks, especially like with NORAD, what should Congress be doing uh, to try to make sure that Canada makes the right decision uh, uh, and, and to follow the lead of their, their military establishment that uh, Huawei should not be a partner for 5G? I think the continuation of what we're doing already, which is the great conversations and the dialogue that we're having with our partner in Canada, uh, again, sharing the intel so that we make sure that they understand fully the risks that they, they might be taking on uh, and so that they can make a, a decision, at the, their own sovereign uh, decision that they will make, but it's an informed decision, fully understanding the risks, the consequences, uh, and ultimately what the rippling effects uh, might be as a result of that from a national security for their own security and then for us together as a binational organization within NORAD as an example uh, and that as we are tied with North America uh, very much so uh, the rippling effects through the through the binational bilateral relationship. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank both of you for your service. Uh, I can only repeat repeat to you what I have heard in talking and listening to people with expertise, and this is how they have kind of explained the Cold War coming to an end and where we are today and, and if we're on top of our game or if we're ahead of our game, that basically the United States uh, in the 80s took the position to be very aggressive in some of the weapons we designed. Russia could not keep up with what we were doing, kind of forced them into a system, uh, a situation where they had to evaluate, could we defend ourselves against American with the superior weapons they've designed? That's what it was given to me in that, along those lines. Now, if you take it from the Cold War forward, uh, have we still stayed on top of our game? Uh, it sounds to me as if hypersonic weapons and other future weapons have been more advanced by other countries, such as China, even Russia coming back into the scene in a, high, in, in a real aggressive way, maybe North Korea to a certain extent. And are we going to be able to, to deter them from moving forward uh, because of our superiority, or are we going to be paying a defense to catch up? So whoever, however you can help me with that, understand it better. Let me start that okay. in terms of, uh, first, uh, I will go back to the, that was a choice by China and Russia to develop those weapons, right? We certainly could have done that, and no, uh, we did not. I think that uh, their actions in many cases speak louder than what they tell us in terms of what their intentions sure. are. And again, this is a competition, right, just like any other military competition. And I am confident uh, that this nation has the ability to produce the capabilities we have to have. And for deterrence, uh, again, the basic equation hasn't changed. Can I deny you your aim or can I impose a cost on you that is greater than what you seek? I can do that if necessary. Admiral, I, I think in general both this, the evaluation was given to me about the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. Is that accurate? Did, did we were just so, we outpaced them so far that they had to come to realization they could not compete and defend themselves. Senator, what I would offer, I would break that into a conventional piece and a strategic deterrence okay. piece. And on the conventional side of the House, in general, I would say that that is in the main correct, right? Yes. And what we're able to do on the strategic deterrence side is hold strategic deterrence, right? The whole goal on strategic deterrence is for nothing to happen. Correct. And we were successfully able to do that. So right. I would recharacterize it slightly in terms of a conventional force um, uh, advantage that we achieved. General. Senator, what I would add to that, though, as you fast forward to today, what we do see is our adversaries really investing in some of that conventional capability um, that does have the ability to hold us at risk, and we have to therefore be able to defend against it. What I'm referring to, for example, is, for example, the SEV submarine that has very good capability that, that carries cruise missiles, some of the long-range aviation like the bombers. with. We have USS West Virginia. I've been on it and spent <laughs> some time with them. I appreciate it. You do an excellent job. Sure. 
And so I, so I think from our perspective, we think a lot from the Cold War about the nuclear aspect and deterrence. I think as we reach today, we also have to factor in the conventional aspect of this and having peer sure. adversaries that have the capability to reach out, reach out to us at home in ways that we didn't have in the Cold War that we have to factor into our defense. My final it. question would be basically you're looking 30 years down the road, at least 30 years down the road, for the weapon, uh, for the life of the weapons that we're, and, and the defense that we're doing with our triad. Are we looking... Uh, uh, at what their capabilities and where they're looking 30 years down the road to, and if they might be to the point to where they're advancing quicker, willing to make more sacrifices, spend more money to become an equal superpower. The one belt, one road, as far as I'm concerned, is China wants to be the only superpower left by 2050. I hope Americans understand that, and I hope we in Congress understand it. That's what I'm concerned about. And I'm determined in my life for my children, whatever I can do and whatever decision can prevent that from happening because this is the greatest country on earth. There's no doubt what, what, what their mission is, right, what China's mission is. Sir, not only do I agree, but I'll give you a quick example. Colombia is going to be in service until 2080, right? Uh, the Navy and the submarine force, and there's Air Force equivalents to this too, have long had very uh, 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 extensive programs that are looking 30 years down the road, and they're physics-based, right? They're not necessarily yeah. intel-based and looking at anything that could be developed into a threat so that we in parallel start working the countermeasure to that. And I have great confidence in those programs. They've served us well. And in my full time, I would just quickly say that that's why the NDS implementation with very clearly focuses on this great competition and the competition with China and in particular in Russia drives us to make sure we do invest in those right resources that will allow us to compete appropriately going into the future, Senator. Well, it's my uh, confidence in military leaders like yourself that give me the confidence for my children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your thoughtfulness in coming before us today. I want to talk a little bit about the hypersonics issue, circle back to that, because of Arnold Engineering Development Complex, which is there in Tennessee, and of course they're very much engaged in some of the work that we are trying to do as we look forward. I actually had some people in the office yesterday, and we discussed uh, this and Arnold's importance to uh, the Air Force. But one of the things that continues to come up as we talk about hypersonics is personnel and a trained workforce. And uh, General O'Shaughnessy, I'd love to hear from you. Do you think we have what we need to meet the demand as we move forward? And um, how do we go about backfilling that? How do you change recruitment in order for us to be able to backfill that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for highlighting that. And I think it's a, uh, one of our things we look at. First, there's a capability, uh, but then there's also a capacity. And as we look at our entire defense uh, industrial base, one of the things I think we have to really focus on is are we able to uh, both have the technology and to make sure we're taking advantage of the emerging technology in the appropriate ways, but also do we have the capacity of which mm -hmm. to turn that into actual weapon systems that can be relevant on the battlefield? I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I had noted in 2017 at a hypersonics conference, I think the Chinese had like 250 papers and it was uh, 10 times what we had had. And um, so, Admiral Richard, as you look at this, are you attracting and training and retaining the, the experts that are going to be needed in order to, to meet this need, meet the demand? Uh, Ma'am, the, the short answer is you are highlighting a, a, a challenge for the department across the board. It's not only in hypersonics that you talk about, but I could point to any number of other areas where we face an equivalent challenge. I've been very pleased in the efforts, uh, particularly by the services, to reach out, uh, uh, develop, attract, uh, and uh, create this industrial base that we're going to have to have not only for hypersonics but for the capabilities writ large. They're working very hard on that. Okay. Then human capital is one component, but then facilities, uh, areas like Arnold Engineering are important. So where are we on the sufficiency of our facilities and having what we need there. Again, I, I applaud service efforts to go after the, uh, the capacity and the industrial base uh, physical plant necessary to um, achieve the results that you're talking about. They're working very hard on both pieces of that. Okay. Um, then highlighting another area, let's move over and talk about electromagnetic spectrum. 
And as you know, this is something where I've spent a good bit of time working on how we proceed in this area, how we utilize so expertise when it comes to working in a contested EW environment. Do we have that? Do are we moving forward with the right type work, uh, the visualization, the modeling, so that we're growing the expertise in this area? So, ma'am, let, uh, let me start that. And, uh, Senator, one, I applaud your interest in your leadership uh, in terms of uh, electromagnetic spectrum, right? That is yet another domain, uh, not unlike space and cyber, that was permissive and we uh, had freedom of maneuver for a very long period of time, and that has changed. So it, too, has to have a certain level of expertise, um, and uh, the, the services are working very hard on that. For example, if you would allow me to have a Navy flashback for a second, I'm a Joint Commander now but just left the Navy, the submarine force, which I recently commanded, has been an emergency flank, wide open, trying to develop that expertise to the point that we have restructured the electronic technician's rating uh, to elevate okay. greater numbers better training, and I could go into more detail on that. You see all the services working like that right now. Let me ask you this. Are we at a point where we should develop a concept of operations for EW? Yes, ma'am. You, you hit on a couple of things that we have to continue to work on. There, there are okay. numerous concepts of operation. To be able to knit them together in a whole is... Right, but we need one overriding one strategy. Piece. And if you're reworking training and looking at a different utilization of expertise, then it seems to me we would be well served to move to one concept of operations that would enable each of our military divisions. Uh, Senator, one, I not only agree, but I would also highlight another point you made earlier that a key piece of that concept is going to be electronic uh, battle management, electronic warfare okay. battle management, the ability to visualize. We cannot be statically assigned anymore in our use of the RS spectrum. We have to be dynamic. We have to maneuver. And we're going to have to be able to visualize and understand it to accomplish that. Uh, the concepts will start from there. Uh, Senator Thank King. you. Yell back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General O'Shaughnessy, one of the questions I ask quite frequently in these hearings is, what does China want? And I want to ask you pointedly, what does China want in the Arctic? Well, thank you, Senator, for allowing me to highlight a little bit of the Arctic and the importance of the Arctic. And as it relates to one of our global competitors uh, and potential adversaries, I think it is important to look at what is, what is uh, their uh, desire in the Arctic. What we see initially uh, is clearly an economic um, desire because of the natural resources that are and it and, and they want to be able to uh, be able to take full advantage of those resources but we also see activity for example the Shui Long uh, one of their supposed scientific uh, research vessels that that potentially could be uh, the precursor to increased uh, submarine activity uh, and those things from a more nefarious uh, aspect and so so we're looking at it uh, clearly to understand what is it they're trying to do but from our perspective we're concerned about that as an avenue of approach. We're concerned about that as a... Uh, but they're clearly of... highly interested. I was at an Arctic conference in Iceland a couple of years ago. There was a 40-person delegation from China, and they've, they've uh, designated themselves as a near-Arctic nation, which is like Australia saying, that you know, uh, but there they are. So they, they clearly... Now, let me follow up. Uh, there was a sentence in your, in your uh, presentation that got my attention. Finally, in the past year, we observed signs of nascent but growing strategic cooperation between China and Russia, including combined bomber patrol last July and Chinese participation in multiple Russian exercises. I find that very uh, important and, and, uh, and concerning. Uh, expand on that a bit, please. Sir, this was a, not particularly concerned the Arctic, but I'll loop it back to the Arctic uh, in, the, in the answer. Uh, what we do see is... But the uh, Arctic is one of the places where they may well find common cause. Absolutely. And that's where I'll, I'll loop back to and where I have some concern there. One of, one of the things we do see is uh, Russia actually has a more advanced operational uh, capability with respect to the longer-range bomber force. Uh, and, and, as, and, and as we see them, very routinely, flying in and around our, uh, our um, ADAs, as an example. Uh, as we see them working with Russia and China together, we have concerns as we just look at that capability. If they were to work together, uh, they could potentially advance China's ability in that regard. 
Um, clearly, in the Arctic, we also see the potential for they work together, but I think there is a little bit different approach because clearly Russia has concerns about China infringing on them from an economic standpoint. Yet, nonetheless, we see Russia with some very um, uh, significant... Well, Russia is being very aggressive in the Arctic in terms of icebreakers, airstrips. I mean, that's a... That's a big part of where they're putting some of their major investments. Exactly. And so that's where I was going with this answer is that we can actually see the potential for China to leverage Russia's capability and capacity and understanding to develop China's Russia. Do you have adequate sensors to determine if something's coming over the top? We do uh, not, sir. And that's, a, that's clearly a gap that needs to be addressed. It, it is, Senator. Uh, let me, in, in a, a couple of minutes, on, on uh, this, is, this hearing seems to be the hypersonic hearing. Uh, and, and I think that's important, and, and the, the budget is important, the, the additional resources. But we're behind. I mean, the, Russia and China are fielding hypersonic missiles now, and aren't we four or five years from there? And my concern is that some of that research should be going into defense, because right now uh, hypersonics are a, a really a nightmare weapon for an aircraft carrier, uh, for all kinds of targets. So. Uh, are we going to put some money into how to defend ourselves against uh, hypersonics, uh, Admiral? The short answer is yes, and I think you see the budget priorities that are uh, being developed to do just that. But I will also go back and offer, particularly for Russia and China, uh, we are defending today by deterrence, right? I can impose a cost on them that I think they will find unacceptable to deter their use of that or any of their other novel weapon systems. How, how do you deter if, if, if we get into a conflict and they... I mean, I don't understand deterrence when they use a hypersonic to take out an aircraft carrier in, in the uh, strait between Iceland and Scotland. I, I Sir, I have any, I'd have to go into a classified session to give you details of uh, options that I could provide uh, to redress that. Well, I just hope that that 23% budget increase, if part of that uh, goes, to de goes to defense. Uh, finally, very briefly, uh, can hypersonics be nuclearized? Can a hypersonic missile carry a nuclear warhead? Senator, absolutely, yes. And so is this really a, a triad 2.0? Uh, because this is a different, it's not a ballistic missile, it's not a submarine, it's not a, uh, it's not an aircraft, or it could be, I guess, all, all three of those. But clearly we need to think about hypersonics in terms of the triad, in terms of our strategic Senator, deterrent. Senator, absolutely, I will offer that it is not our policy or intent right now to nuclearize hypersonics. Uh, uh, other nations can choose to do what they wish in that area. And, and yes, right, this is, th this is the competition. This has a lot of similarities to the introduction of the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile back in the late 50s and early 60s, right. and we're ready to address it. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and, and appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank both of you for your service and for being here. And I'll, I was going to start, Admiral Richard, with a question about uh, the GBSD, uh, and you answered it beautifully for, uh, for Senator Fisher and, and in your statements. But, but just, I'll just emphasize the importance of, of uh, doing all we can to keep it on track, if not even uh, escalate a little bit. And that is reflected, of course, in the budget, and, and appreciate that. Um, I want to ask both of you some questions about the standing up of Space Force, and starting with you, of course, Admiral Richard, given your, you, the unique relationship between STRATCOM and, and space and space capabilities. And, and first, generally ask you, uh, are you comfortable with, with how it's going in terms of, of uh, the standing up of Space Force? And what and how are you communicating with Space Force in terms of helping them be successful in, in uh, you know, training, equipping, manning the, the, the force? Senator, I would draw a distinction between Space Command, uh, yes. the Joint Operational Command, and the Space Force. Uh, my relationship is much more with uh, Space Command. And, and Senator, I would describe it as we're the proud parents, right? Uh, we uh, were where those responsibilities came from. I am delighted that the decision the nation and the department has made, it is putting a necessary attention to our freedom of maneuver and action inside space. General Raymond and I speak frequently. We're setting up a set of warfighter talks here in the very near future. And I'm encouraged across the board that it improves mission performance overall, particularly as responsibilities as the sensor manager, looking across missile warning, missile defense, and space situational awareness. Um, the nation wins because we're more effectively utilizing our assets. Very well said. And, and G General Shaughnessy, so, so again, same basic issue, obviously the relationship between Space Command and, and Stratcom is special, but yours is awfully important as well. 
Yeah, thank you, Senator. And, and one, I just I, I am excited uh, about both of the, both the Space Force and U.S. Space Command. I think we're already starting to see some of the the benefits uh, of this. And I think we as a nation are very fortunate to have a great American, uh, Jay Raymond, uh, leading both of these at this time and, and really chartering the course uh, that these will take going into the future. Specifically for us, for Homeland Defense. Uh, from the NORTHCOM role, we are very much tied to, from the U.S. Space Command side, relative to those sensors, the very sensors that uh, Emma Richard mentioned are the ones that we're using for our own homeland defense. And the second aspect is we look at war fighting as, as space, the domain of war fighting that occurs, and we are now, we're talking about that in really relevant ways, and clearly from a homeland defense aspect, that has significant consequences. And then from a U.S. Space Force, excited about the potential there as that's now been stood up of how that's going to allow us to really focus like a laser on space going into the future. Well, just um, following up a little bit on that, one of the you know one of the challenges I think, of course, is actually manning, you know, training, equipping this this force. And I think that the services all have to all play a role in that, which I think is somewhat unique to the to the way Space Force has been designed to be successful and certainly look forward to anything that you can, can add to that discussion as well. Uh, and then, and then I'm, as long as you're going to have it, not, as, as I run out of time, I'm gonna, I want you to answer that if you have more to say about it. And then a, a, actually ask you about uh, our northern tier bases. Of course, I have three of them in North Dakota. And um, what, what we ought to be looking for in terms of capabilities to meet a, a potential Arctic um, conflict and, and make sure that, that we're in sync with, with the strategy. Well, I'll start first on, on the Space Force. Clearly, the intent is it's not just a, uh, a, a pulling away from just the United States Air Force, but actually looking at what, uh, within the Department of Defense, where are, our, where are our space experts and how do we actually bring them into the, uh, the Space Force as well. Um, that aside, relative to your question on the Arctic, we're, we're actually excited about some of the things that we're actually doing uh, right now uh, in your state uh, to support our Arctic operations. Uh, clearly, we see the future and our defense of our nation is very uh, critically dependent on our ability to operate in the Arctic, our ability to have domain awareness. So some of the things we're doing with over-the-horizon radars, uh, critically important for us to have that domain awareness, that understanding of what is happening on the approaches to our nation in, 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 in cooperation with Canada uh, through North America is critically important. And whether you're talking hypersonics uh, and the over-the-horizon radars have great capability against the hypersonics so we can maintain that custody, uh, or whether we're talking about the cruise missile threats and the bombers, uh, those are all played because some of the work that we're doing uh, within your state. Well said, and I appreciate both of you. And yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Admiral Richard, and uh, General Shaughnessy. Uh, your, your command areas play a, a very important role in defending the United States from the threat of ballistic uh, missiles. And I note that the uh, Missile Defense Agency's budget request discusses a, a layered approach uh, to homeland defense as the underlay to the current ground-based mid-course defense system that protects the continental United States. Specifically, the MDA request discusses Aegis and THAAD as potential options for a layered uh, homeland defense approach. But I'm uh, also interested in the potential for transportable ground-based interceptors or other systems that can serve as, a, as an underlay to existing GMD system and add flexibility and depth in a, in a cost-effective way. Uh, as you know, MDA has completed an environmental impact statement of three locations uh, to host a potential third uh, GMD site, including two fields at Fort Custer in Michigan, uh, which were identified as the least expensive and least environmentally impacted uh, site. But the question uh, for both of you is, can you please discuss how you view the potential of a layered homeland missile defense system, and what role would the three locations which MDA has already studied play in this uh, layered system? Uh, Senator, I'll start with this. And uh, first, I'll, I'll talk to one of the uh, reasons that this demand signal is there is we look at the, the cancellation of RKV and the resulting timeline between now and when an NGI um, next-gen interceptor could be fielded. Uh, we have very significant concerns about that from NORTHCOM. We've been working closely uh, with both MDA as well as osd &E, Dr. Griffin, and I'm pleased to announce now that we've actually, we're bringing time in as a variable within that discussion, and so what we're trying to do, we can't wait 10 years to get the next-gen interceptor fielded. We're trying to bring that left, and so I think we'll see as the RFP 
actually gets released, we are actually looking to bring time left and get that fielded faster. And I think uh, we're, we're in a good position there. But that brings you to a part of that mitigation uh, as the threat continues to advance is this layered defense concept, which we very much support. And you see money in the budget this year for. The initial concept, to your point, was to bring in as an underlayer uh, the ability to use whether it be a THAAD modified potentially with an additional uh, boost capability or whether it be an SM-32A missile that we could use in that regard is existing capability that we could bring into the home and defense architecture to provide that ballistic missile defense. But the fall on to that is, okay, we will understand using that existing capability, but what is, the, what is the capability we could actually develop that might not be what we need to deploy overseas, but we could use specifically built for our homeland defense? And that gets into the point where the, the next iteration of the delayer defense might be individual weapon systems that are designed to be uh, 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 fielded within the continental U.S. and in Alaska to defend the United States uh, using maybe the technology that's in our current systems, but portrayed a different way. And I think all the work that's been done with all of the Continental Interceptor sites will go into potentially where we could put those, how we do those. So I think it's just part of the information that we now have as we look at this new approach with both uh, the current GBI, the NGIs, this layered defense with current system, additional system informed by some of the work that we've done uh, to include within your state. Great. Thank you. Admiral, you want to add anything? Just very quickly, the uh, missile defense is deterrence by denial. Uh, we have a very clear national policy on what it's designed for and what it's uh, not designed for. And so everything General O'Shaughnessy just talked about not only um, allows him to execute his mission responsibilities, but it is a part of the tailored deterrence strategies that I'm required by the Nuclear Posture Review to develop. And so uh, that's precisely the path I think we need to go down. I would throw in uh, sensing is also a key piece, as both of us have talked about. Uh, one final question. I'm the ranking member on Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee within this uh, committee, and, and one area that I've been focusing on are some of the ethics associated with the military application of artificial intelligence and automation uh, in particular. And I know there are a number of ethical concerns related to these weapons, and, and I think the dilemma is represented by the threat uh, that you both identified in your written statements of Russia's nuclear-capable autonomous underwater weapon, uh, the Poseidon. And I know uh, what the threat is is all up to debate to talk about, but if we face time-sensitive threats in, in the U.S., at a tacti are, we, are, are we at a tactical disadvantage if we require human involvement in our decision chain where our adversaries may not do that? Uh, Senator, I'll, I'll take that. Um, and what I would say is what we have to get away from is what we now have is either the human uh, in the loop or sometimes a human is the loop in, in some of our systems uh, to a human on the loop. And what that allow you to do is actually make those decisions at the speed of relevance, because what can and should be done by machines and by AI and leveraging that will be done by that, but it will identify those key areas where we humans have to be the ones ethically, morally making those decisions. And so I think human on the loop is a concept we need to apply to leverage that uh, capability whilst not uh, preventing ourselves from operating at the speed of relevance. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, by the way, we've been uh, notified the first vote is underway, so we're going to try to get to everybody here. Uh, let's tr try to keep our, our remarks brief. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, Admiral, let me start with you. As you know, we are the proud home in Missouri of the Whiteman Air Force Base and the B-2 bomber. Uh, let me ask you about the Air Force's budget request and the uh, funding cuts for the B-2 defense management system. Does that decision cause you any concern about the B-2's ability to operate in high-end threat environments to the end of its service life? Senator, I think that is a great example of some of the difficult decisions that we're going to have to make and trading or balancing near-term risk for long-term risk. And so overall, the Air Force is way ahead uh, on the bomber program, bomber roadmap, I think it's referred to. I endorse, I think that is a very thoughtful approach uh, in uh, the uh, loss of the defensive management system. We will accommodate that risk uh, for the greater gain the Air Force is going to provide overall. That sounds like a yes to me. Do you think that there is a, a, a risk that, uh, uh, that it, it will, uh, there will be some detriment to its ability to operate in high-end capacity? There is, but I can manage it. Uh, what else do we need to ensure that the B-2 maintains its ability to operate in those environments if this decision goes forward? Uh, that is uh, part of the planning that I have to do. So we will use operational mechanisms to compensate for uh, technological uh, abilities of the aircraft. 
I, I retain full confidence that the B-2 can do the missions that I'll ask it to do. Great. Well, I'll, I'll be following up with you on that. General, let me turn to you for a second. Uh, Russian bombers make re regular visits to our coastlines, we know. What role would you say that the F-15EX could play in protecting our homeland against these and other threats in the decades that are coming? Yeah, one, one of the things that we do see is it's not only the increasing uh, frequency, but also the complexity uh, of how they're uh, maneuvering and, and, the, and the missions that they're flying. Uh, some of it is, has to do with uh, where we would need to go to intercept them based on the length of their uh, missiles that they carry, the, the range that the missiles now have. For example, the AS-23 is an example of a long-range missile. What that means is we, we want to intercept them further out, right? We want to go further so that we can not only get the missiles, we want to hit the bombers, right, so that we, they never actually get to launch them. Um, and so the F-15EX brings us that. It brings us that extended range that we can get with the F-15X, uh, as well as the, a much significant improvement in the number of missiles it can carry. So we see that from the home-end defense aspect, we see the, uh, that new platform as being uh, well-suited for the home-end defense role in both our counter cruise missile defense, our counter uh, airborne threats, such as the Russian bombers. Great. That, that's, um, that's great to hear. Admiral, let me come back to you. Let's talk a little bit about the nuclear policy. Are you confident that Beijing would stick to its no first use, its announced no first use policy if there were a conflict with the United States? Senator, I think I could drive a truck through that no first use policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, why, uh, why do you say that? I mean, why is that the in case? In other words, and I'm not trying to be flippant on a very serious matter, right? Um, the, uh, the number of situations where they may conclude that first use has occurred, right, that don't meet our definition of first use, uh, and, and really, and I should back up. They are very opaque about what their intentions are. They're very different from the Russians. We have very little to go on in terms of how they interpret that relative to what we see uh, from the other competitor. So what constitutes first use? Uh, where might they say we're actually not a, that, that's our territory, right? Uh, therefore, it doesn't count a, as an attack against you. And more broadly, right, I mean, Soviet Union had a no first use policy. I don't think we took great comfort in that either. Uh, and so these the declaratory policy things, uh, uh, the, the, not helpful in, in my mission area to deter. That, that's very helpful and I think is a, is a great point uh, uh, for those who would advocate a no first use policy on our end as to why that that would be, I think, a very serious strategic mistake. Let me give you, Admiral, still on the same subject, an opportunity to clarify something. A senior U.S. official recently was reported as saying, and I'm quoting now, the sole reason the United States has nuclear weapons is to prevent others from using nuclear weapons. Th that doesn't seem to be exactly what our declaratory policy is. Can you clarify what our declaratory policy is? So the Nuclear Posture Review lays it out uh, very clearly in terms of uh, our uh, strategic capabilities are designed to deter a strategic attack on the United States, which can be nuclear, but I think it wisely acknowledged the fact that it now may be possible to have a strategic attack against our vital interests that is non-nuclear, particularly in space and cyber. Right. So we will only consider the employment of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances to defend our vital interests or those of our allies or partners. Uh, and those, those circumstances could include, as you just said, significant non-nuclear strategic attacks. Is that correct? No, Sandra, Am I getting that correct? Great. Uh, Admiral, I've got another question for you about uh, the W-76 TAC-2. I'll submit that for the record because I'm about out of time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both uh, for your service. In particular, Admiral Richard, as a one Alabama native to another, uh, thank you for your service. Alabama is very proud of you, and so is the University of Alabama Roll Tide. I just thought I'd throw that in real quickly. Uh, I know you appreciate that. Um, the other thing that folks in Alabama are particularly proud of these days is our 117th Air Refueling Wing, which, as you know, won the prestigious Stratcom Omaha Trophy this past year. Uh, and I want to take the opportunity to congratulate Colonel Scott Grant, the commander there, um, just done an amazing job, uh, Command Chief Master Sergeant Davis and the other airmen. I, I think sometimes our National Guard units kind of get overlooked in the scheme of things, and, and I so much appreciate them winning that award. It's the first time a Guard unit has won that. Can you talk a little bit about the critical role that uh, the unit plays in the strategic deterrence mission that we have? Uh, Senator, and I would just uh, highlight that's a very competitive award, right? And it, it speaks highly of that wing's ability to compete in that broad a competition. Uh, air refueling is vital, right? Uh, I, I'm not an airman, but no gas, no bombs. Uh, and so it is uh, critical to my mission set for the bomber leg to have adequate tanking capacity. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy will tell you here in a second it is equally critical in his areas for homeland air defense. 
uh, and it's something we pay very close attention to in terms of having uh, capability in the right priority to meet those missions. Great. Well, thank you. Um, this past Monday, the President's budget request um, and the briefings that we've got indicated that the Air Force intends to divest several aging aircraft, namely the 17 B-1 bombers, 16 KC-10 tankers, 13 KC-135 tankers. Uh, and to replace the tankers, the budget asked for 15 KC-146s, but those are not going to be fully operational for another three years. So with the delay in the operational capability uh, status of the KC-46s, does this in any way, does this uh, divestiture of these legacy tankers pose any kind of threat uh, to the reliable in-air refueling capability of the Joint Force? And I'll ask either, either or both of you that question. I'll start, Senator, and say uh, in this year's budget, I think our United States Air Force uh, made some difficult uh, decisions in, in how do we get to the future faster. Uh, this is just one of those uh, decisions where we're trying to get uh, divest yourselves of legacy platforms whilst moving to the future, in this case, the KC-46. Um, and so whilst, yes, there will be an impact in the short term uh, to the, uh, the availability of tankers, uh, we will be able to mitigate our way through that. We still are working closely. In fact, I talked to the Transcom commander uh, just yesterday about this. I believe we'll be able to mitigate that going forward, but it is, it is crucial that we are able to get to the KC-46 and uh, multiple other um, uh, modern platforms that the Air Force is trying to get to. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you both for being here. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I will yield back. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Uh, we'll now recognize Senator Sullivan at the conclusion of his remarks. We will be adjourned. Uh, Senator Sullivan thank presiding. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for your service. Uh, General Shaughnessy, I particularly appreciate your testimony. It's probably the most comprehensive, insightful uh, description of our strategic interests in the Arctic that I've seen. In, in your testimony, you say the Arctic is the new front line of homeland defense. Sounds like you're saying that the Arctic and Alaska are no longer a sanctuary from which we can safely project power, but it's more of a battle space area. Is that correct? And what are the implications from your mindset as a NORTHCOM commander? Uh, that, that's exactly correct, Senator. And, and as always, uh, I find myself well aligned with you relative to the importance of the Arctic, not only from the strategic location that it is, but now to your point, it is clearly an avenue of approach to our, our great nation. And as we look at what needs so to be done. That impacts the whole nation. It, it impacts nation. the whole nation, absolutely. And so as we look at now Alaska, uh, where for, I'll just use the Russian long range aviation, uh, we look at uh, whether it be hypersonics or whether it be the cruise missiles that can be launched from that long range aviation. Um, we clearly see that avenue of approach as being critical. So we have to, one, have awareness of what's going on in that space, and then we have to be able to defend in that space. And the time that will be required uh, to respond is short because of the pure geography. Uh, and so I think what we really need to think about in Alaska is how do we invest to have that awareness, that domain awareness, having the right sensors and ability to understand what's happening, but also the ability to defend immediately and what are the systems that we could uh, invest in that would allow us to have that persistent defense in Alaska because it is key terrain uh, that will be important to us as a nation uh, in any conflict, whether that be with uh, Russia or uh, China uh, going forward. Thank you. Let me uh, let me go into a li little bit more detail. You know, it seems from whether it's Secretary Pompeo's speech in Finland at the Arctic Council, major publications like New York Times, 60 Minutes, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the great power competition in the Arctic. I appreciate Senator King highlighting that and his questions for you. You know, unfortunately, this committee has observed that the Pentagon is the organization that sometimes seems the furthest behind, with the exception of uh, certainly your great advocacy, General Shaughnessy, in your personal opinion and the advocate for the capabilities in the region, what specific capabilities are you advocating for to ensure that we can both uh, protect the homeland in these avenues of approach that you talked about, but also to continue to project power uh, from Alaska to not just PACOM, but UCOM, STRATCOM, and if you can talk on J Park and even Oconus KC-46 deployments, that would be helpful as well in terms of capabilities. Thank you, Senator. First, I'd say we have to complete the next generation interceptor. We have literally holes in the, in the ground right now that we need to fill with uh, capabilities. So we need to bring that left, and we need to bring that as fast as possible. 
We need to augment that with additional ballistic missile capability that we could put in Alaska, uh, whether that be SM-32As, whether that be um, the potentially uh, THAAD uh, deployments there. We need to bring that into Alaska, and we need a sensing capability uh, that will be persistent, that will be steady state, that will always be there, uh, that we have the technology today, we just have to deploy it uh, to Alaska. Second thing I think we need, and I, I would applaud the Air Force for moving the additional fifth-gen aircraft, the F-35s to Isleson is, is uh, now truly the fifth-gen center of excellence, and therefore you need a place to train. And so I think continued investment in the J-Park range is critically important, not only for fifth gen, but for the Arctic. And Arctic Edge uh, upcoming exercise we have with great participation, for example, from the Marines, I think is critically important because the Joint Force needs to train in, in Arctic conditions. I make the, the, the observation that we can deploy a force anywhere all over the world, and we can train that force very quickly and have them out the door in a matter of days. You cannot do that to the Arctic. If you are not training, if you don't have the right equipment, and if you are not versed in operating the Arctic, you will not effectively be able to operate there, and our adversaries are operating there, and therefore we need to be able to operate there as well. To your point, it is now battle space, and so we need to be able to operate in Alaska, in the Arctic, uh, in cooperation with Canada from the NORAD side. And so I think continued investment, the tankers are important because it's a strategic uh, place where you can actually get to the European theater quicker than you can even get to the South China Sea uh, from mainland, from, from Alaska. Uh, and therefore, I think having that as a center where we have robust tankers is important, um, as well as the entire joint force, I think, just continuing to be able to operate. The Secretary of Defense said that if you co-located the over 100 fifth gen fighters that we're going to have in Alaska with the OCONUS deployment of KC-46s, it would show that our adversaries, w that we would have extreme strategic reach, whether in PACOM or UCOM. Do you agree with that? I do believe there's a powerful synergy of bringing together the fifth generation uh, with additional and modern day uh, tanker capability. Let me ask one final question for both of you. Actually, just two real quick ones. In, in our office call, you talked about your number one unfunded priority for some type of space-based communications for the Arctic. Can you just briefly touch on that? Uh, thank you, Senator, for allowing us to highlight that. One of my main concerns in the Arctic is communication. Uh, basic communication that we normally use satellites for becomes challenged above about 65, even harder above 70. One of the things we find is the commercial uh, technology is there. Uh, and so we've been working with commercial companies for the proliferation of LEO um, and finding ways that we might be able to bring that uh, ability to have essentially broadband connectivity uh, anywhere, for example, within Alaska. Uh, and that is a huge implication for us to be able to operate if we can connect the force in areas that today we can't connect the force, even through our commercial partners. And so whether it's OneWeb, whether it's Starlink, uh, we think, for example, in some of our partnership with Starlink over the last uh, uh, several experiments that we've done, uh, for example, at Eglin, where we are able to show and uh, our ability to connect that force with their satellites that are, this is not hypothetical, this is satellites that are in orbit today. So, and, so and, but it's your, it's your number one unfunded priority because that, is not just protecting the comms in the Arctic, that protects the whole homeland in terms of the avenue approach concern that you talked about. That's exactly right, Senator. It is my number one priority to have Arctic comms, and I think the proliferation of wheel and a Starlink or a, a OneWeb type solution is a way to get it fastest. Final question for both of you gentlemen, and it's a, just a quick answer on this, but I have been frustrated uh, with Undersecretary Griffin. You know, I think we're seeing really smart guys in the Pentagon making dumb decisions. Let me give you one and was already briefly touched on. This committee has worked really hard in a bipartisan way with the administration, uh, fully supporting it to build up our missile defense. There's now been a decision recently, despite the fact that we just built 20 new silos at Fort Greeley, to make those empty for the next 10 years. I can't think of something that is unequivocally more, um, uh, well, that's just going to, harm our readiness in terms of missile defense. I, I mean, there's no dispute about that. 20 empty silos for 20 years. How do we fix that, gap fill that, and correct what to me seems like a, just a kind of a boneheaded decision at the upper levels of the Pentagon? Uh, Senator, well, I, first I will say that the unfortunate decision to cancel the RKV was the right decision that was made at that time. But do you agree to have 20 empty silos for uh, the no, next sir, 10 where, years? Where I, where I am very uh, um, dissatisfied with is that it's going to take us 10 years to, to, to actually produce the, the next-gen interceptor. And so we've been working very closely with MDA and Dr. Griffin personally. met with them on Monday, and I'm pleased to announce that we are, we are going to bring this left. 
Uh, the way we'll have to do that is we'll have to find some trade space, but we have to put time as an important part of this because our adversaries are not waiting. Right. Our adversaries are drilling capability and capacity, and so we have to be able to respond. So we're going to insert time into this so that we're going to have trade space developed so we can bring, a, we can bring uh, missiles to put in, interceptors to put into those holes sooner. Thank you. Admiral, any views on that? I would just say that General O'Shaughnessy described that very well. We both have a, a role in setting the requirements for missile defense. Those requirements are valid, and uh, General O'Shaughnessy just laid out how we're going to go meet those. Well, I believe this committee will be supportive of any role that we can play in support to help fill that gap, uh, which I think is important for the nation's uh, missile defense overall. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I, we all appreciate your testimony. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.